to begin this morning by reading um, a prayer that Jesus prayed for us as the church. This prayer is, is, follows a prayer for his disciples. It's found in John chapter 17. Jesus says this, he says, my prayer is not for them alone, referring to his disciples. He, pray, he says, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, us, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. So they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and I have loved them even as you have loved me. This is Jesus' prayer for the church. And if I were to ask you, just sort of a, a free association this morning, if I were to ask you what the first word that pops into your head when you think about the church, when you think about the, the modern church from your perspective and from your experiences, what, what is the word that most readily comes to mind for you? For some of you, it, it, it may be a very positive perspective. You may in this COVID era have chosen a word like creative or innovative as churches have looked for new ways to continue to preach the message of Christ and to encourage and to care for people. Some of you, your first experience in church was being surrounded by people that loved you and that made you feel welcome, so you might choose a word like loving. Some of you, you may have come to the church through a ministry like Shepherd's Heart, and so you might choose a word like supportive. Perhaps for some of us, the word is, is a little more critical or negative. We all know that, that for many people, their first response, their first idea of the church, we see in, this, in surveys, is that it's, it's hypocritical or, or judgmental. We talked about that this summer. Maybe, maybe you look at it and you think of a word like conflicted as the church continues to figure out what does it look like to, to live out the kingdom of Christ in the world that we exist in now? Or maybe for you, it's just simply irrelevant. Maybe for you, you think of the church as, as out of touch. And with all of these possibilities, and of course, many, many more that we didn't name, I wonder for how many of us, the first thought that comes into our mind, that pops into our mind when we think about the church is the word unified. Or, for, or perhaps from a, a different perspective. When was the last time that you are with a, a group of people, whether it's at work or, or neighbors, perhaps a group of people that, that don't necessarily uh, identify as followers of Jesus or aren't involved in the church, and, and that you heard someone make the comment, have you noticed how those Christians always seem to be on the same page? How they, they seem to be pulling in the same direction? Like that's that's not an idea, it's not an observation that, that I see trending on Twitter. Because it, is it possible that the very thing that Jesus prayed that the church would be is, is being neglected? Today, as we, as we discuss this topic of unity, I, I want to suggest that perhaps the church is not as dysfunctional as we sometimes assume that it is or perceive that it is, and by that I mean that sometimes we, I believe, mistake unity to be uniformity. And those are not the same thing. But I would also suggest that the church is not as unified as it could be or it should be. And furthermore, that a lack of unity within the church will dilute or compromise our witness to the world around us. And so just kind of as a rough definition of, of unity... I want to suggest that unity within the church means agreement in the gospel. It means a shared purpose and a shared identity. But that is displayed in a diversity of, of perspective. It's displayed in a diversity of gifts and service. It's displayed in a diversity of the people and the experience and diversity and creativity. So shared in our understanding of, of what the gospel is and what Jesus has accomplished, shared in this purpose that Jesus left us here with, shared in this new identity that we have in him, 
but different in the way that this gets lived out in our community. So today we're going to look at a passage in, in Philippians chapter 2 as we continue to study Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. A part of a passage where, where Paul is going to speak it directly into this, this desire for unity. And in doing so, give us a, an example for the church, I think, um, today. And this passage that we're going to read in Philippians chapter 2, Timothy Keller in, in a sermon on this, these same verses, he, he referred to these verses and he said, if you think of Scripture as a mountain range, Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 11 is, is one or two or three of the tallest peaks. And so at the very outset, we're, we're, we're not going to cover everything that the, this rich passage um, avails to us. And yet we do want to, to dive in and look at this topic of unity. So this is Philippians 2, beginning in verse 1. This is what Paul writes. He says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one Spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. But rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now let's take a, a few moments to look together at Paul's vision of, of what it means to have unity through Christ, what it means to be unified in the church as he writes this to these people he loves in, in Philippi. And Paul begins by rooting the church in a common experience. This is the first thing we see here. It's a common experience. I don't know if you've ever heard of the bader mainhoff phenomenon. It's sometimes also referred to as the frequency illusion. This is that, that sense that you get when you go out and you purchase a new car. And then when you start to drive around, you notice how many of that same make and model is out there. Like you see it everywhere you go. It's, it's the frequency illusion. It's a sense of commonality, common experience that, that enables you to see that around you. We do this in sports teams all the time, right? It, it, I could be walking down the street. Many of you know I'm, I'm a huge Ohio State fan. And, and if I could see another Ohio State, man, uh, Ohio State fan out there somewhere, it's, it's very likely that I'm going to shout out to that person, Go Bucks! or OH, and they'll respond, I-O. Ohio State fans love to prove the fact that we know how to spell Ohio. And, and, and we do that because there's this shared affinity. There's this common experience that we have. I've hugged fully grown men that are complete strangers to me in Ohio Stadium because we have this shared affinity. Paul begins this section of his letter with a, a series here of, of rhetorical questions, but they're, they're more than questions. They're really statements to the church of a common experience. He says, does anybody find encouragement from, from the fact that you've been united with Christ? Do you, do you, get, do you get any comfort in knowing that, that he loves you? Do, do we all have the same spirit working in us? Has he shown us any tenderness and compassion? Have any of us experienced this? Of, of course, Paul is, is not wondering if this is the case for them. He's reminding the church in Philippi that this has been their experience. He's saying, since you have encouragement from being united with Christ, 
since you have comfort from his love, since the same Holy Spirit that is at work in you is at work in me, since, since you and I are both the benefactors of his tenderness and compassion in the gospel, he says, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, by having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind, Paul writes. See, Paul, Paul lays the foundation for unity in the shared experience of Christ's transformative work in our lives. It's, it's the impact of the gospel for everyone who has trusted Jesus for their salvation. When Paul is writing to, to the church uh, in Galatia, he, he talks about this, this unifying component, this, this experience of the gospel, and he says it this way. This is in Galatians chapter 3. He says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. This is what he says. He says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. This is the the level ground at the foot of, of the cross. There's There's no hierarchy. There's no pecking order. This is one of the distinctives of the early church. This is what what made them so unique, why they stood out in in, in a time, in a day, in age when when people lived in their tribes, even even more so than we do now. It was was the church that was this multi-ethnic, multi-racial, diverse in their socioeconomic status, gathering of people who shared a common experience in grace available through faith in Jesus. It's it's the foundation for the experience of, of unity. And this, according to Paul, should, should result in, in making his joy complete. Being like-minded, having the same love, being in, of one spirit and of one mind. This is, this is Paul's desire for the church. This is, this is what he asked of them. This is what would make his joy complete. But if, if Paul addresses this common experience, if he lays this out for us, then why Why do we fail to experience this sort of unity that Paul is describing here? Even though we share this this common faith in Jesus. And Paul goes on, he he goes on then, and the second thing we see here is he describes a common problem. Paul describes a common problem, verse 3 now. Paul says this. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And herein lies the problem. I, uh, um, when, my, when my kids were little, I remember being at this family gathering back in Ohio, and we were in my grandma's house, and there was cousins and aunts and uncles, and everybody was milling about, and I was catching up, and the food was starting to get set out, and one of my children, who will remain nameless, one of my daughters started to try to get my attention. And she was pulling on my pant leg and tugging on my arm and, and saying, Daddy, will you help me? Daddy, will you help me? And I kept kind of pressing pause and saying, hang on just a second. And as I was trying to finish this, this conversation with my cousin, and my daughter got to this point of, of frustration in the middle of the conversation. She just threw her head back. She took this deep breath, and at the top of her lungs, she just yelled out, will somebody listen to me? Will somebody listen to me? I'm not getting noticed, right? And so I'm going to do whatever it is that I have to do. Now, I understand this illustration isn't perfect. It's, it's really more of an illustration of negligent parenting, probably on my part. But, but that sentiment speaks directly into what Paul is describing here when he talks about selfish ambition and vain conceit. See, the question that we have to ask ourselves, if we, if you and I, if we as the church share this life-changing common common experience that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, then then why aren't we unified? Why why are, why do we fight? 
Why do we argue? Why do we unfriend each other on Facebook? Why, when we think about the church, isn't the word unity among the list of descriptors that come to mind? Well, Paul sees the problem as as selfish ambition and, and action and vain conceit, a motivator. James, the brother of Jesus, he He dives into this as well, and he elaborates a bit on this. This is from James chapter 4. He says it this way. He says, "What, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires, vain conceit, that battle within you, your desires, but you desire, but you do not have, so you kill and you covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. James describes this same core issue that is plaguing the church that he's writing to. I think this is, this is one of those moments when we think about this passage in, in Philippians chapter 2, where our English translations fail a bit to capture the fullness of what Paul is writing to us, the depth of of his instructions to the church when he tells us to do nothing out of selfish ambition or or vain conceit. I heard Timothy Keller describe it this way. He he talked about uh, vain conceit, and he talked about how the King James Version translates this Greek word as, as vain glory. He suggests this is a, a better rendering. It's the Greek word kenodoxin. So that word dox, doxo, is, is the Greek word for glory, like our doxology. And so when we think of kenodoxo or empty glory, a, a, a missing glory, or in other words, Paul is, is saying to the church, do nothing out of glory hunger. And the impact of sin from the very outset has been to disconnect us from relationship, relationship with God, relationship with each other, and it disconnects us from our purpose. This impact of sin is this deep-seated sense in our lives that we don't matter, that we're unnoticed and ignored. Keller goes on to suggest that, that what we fear most as human beings is not to be hated or oppressed, but rather it's to be ignored. And so what do we do when we're operating out of of glory starvation? We fight for it. We we, we manufacture it. To quote James, we, we kill and we covet and we quarrel and we fight. I'm not, I'm not sure that I've ever heard such a, such a succinct but also accurate description of our human condition. And the reality is, is this, this, this manufactured glory, it's a facade. Right? It, it never satisfies, it, it never quenches this thirst, and so we're in this perpetual search for more. This perpetual search for this, forget, this uh, significance that that fails to satisfy our deepest need, which ultimately leads then to, to this action, to selfish ambition. If, if vain conceit is the, the motivating desire, then selfish ambition is our response. And while we don't have time to dive into this fully, I, the way that, that I think about it is selfish ambition in me seeks to put me at the center of the story. It's the advancement of me in order to acquire this glory that I feel deprived of. So why do we fight? Why do we quarrel? It's it's, it's because of me. It's because this need, this felt need that I have, in order to achieve this in my life, in order for me to ascend, I have to make sure that you descend. And it's a disease. It, 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 It poisons unity. It shows up in in a variety of ways and to various degrees, but we all have it. And Paul says it it kills unity. 
Which brings us then to the, to the antidote that he prescribes. And this is the, the comprehensive remedy. The comprehensive remedy. I want to return for a moment back to this, this prayer that, that Jesus offered. This is in John 17 again. I, I want us to hear this. When he's praying for the church, when he's praying for you and I, he says this. He says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that we may be one, uh, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me so that they, talking about us, may be brought together in complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Did you hear what Jesus prays for us there? He, he is asking his father to fill this glory emptiness that is our human condition and sin. This absence of, of significance, he prays that, that this glory that has been given to him would be given to us. I have never understood the depth of Jesus' prayer for the church until I saw it in light of what Paul writes here in Philippians chapter 2. Jesus giving us his glory. And so let's look at, at what Paul prescribes here. Back in Philippians 2. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that the, at the name of Jesus every knee should bow on heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. See, here's, here is Paul's remedy to selfish ambition and vain conceit that erodes unity. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Paul is saying, I, I want you as the body of Christ, I want you to think, I want you to see the world, to see each other in the same way Jesus does. And, and, and this soaring description that Paul gives us here of what Christ has accomplished, of, of the power of the incarnation unfolds so much of, of Jesus um, willingness to, to go to any level in order to redeem. There's so much for us to apply and to think about here, but for our purposes today, I just, I want to highlight two of these components. We talk about how do we experience, how do we experience unity within the life of the church? It says that he, he made himself nothing in verse 7. It says that he took on the very nature of a servant. So we, we begin here to understand, we begin to see the fullness of what humility looks like. Jesus didn't, didn't come to stake his claim. He didn't come to exert his rights. He, he didn't come to demand what was already his. He laid it down. He laid it down for our sake, for our salvation. Jesus understood his his equality with God, this status that was rightfully his, not as a matter of privilege to be used for his own advantage, but rather as a right to be laid down for our benefit, for our sake. There is no denying that, that we live in a culture and a world that, that tells us to claim what is ours, to demand our rights, but Paul is looking at the church in Philippi and he's saying, as it relates to you, to those of us who share the common experience of grace through faith in Jesus, 
He's saying, like Jesus, we lay it down. We lay it down for the benefit of our brother and our sister. We lay it down for the benefit of the world that looks at a church and sees it unified in its identity and its purpose and its understanding of the gospel. And then as he describes this, this mindset of Christ, he says that this, this Christ-like mindset, this way of thinking, it leads us to radical and sacrificial obedience. Verse 8, he says, In being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by become, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, having our need for glory met in Christ turns our, our battling with one another for status and meeting, and it frees us to live in obedience. It frees us to live in costly obedience to the kingdom vision that Jesus laid out for us in the Gospels. One of which is that his followers would be unified so that the world may believe, he says. You see, the stakes are, are too high for us to fail as it relates to unity. I'm not asking that we all see things the same. I'm not asking that we all understand the same solution to the problems that our, wor our world face. I'm, I'm not asking that we, that we agree on every point. But the stakes are, are too high for us to be in a disagreement about, about what the gospel is, what it teaches, about our shared, shared purpose and shared identity. Because as Jesus prayed, the world will see our agreement with each other and what Christ has done on our behalf. And they'll understand that Jesus loves us and that he loves them. Several weeks ago, um, when, when I was processing and continue to process um, so much of, of the racial tension that we're experiencing in, in our nation right now, I, I called up a friend who is a pastor in the south side of Chicago. I've known him for many years. Uh, for, for many years, we would take students into the Roseland neighborhood um, to Roseland Christian Reform Church and do service projects and work. And, and so I just called him and said, hey, can I, can I come down and just talk? And, and he said, yeah, come on down. He said, uh, better yet, he said, come, come down. And they have a, much like Shepherd's Heart here at Chapel Street, their church has a food pantry. And so on Thursdays, they, they take the groceries to those who aren't able to get out of the home and deliver them. He said, I'm going to be doing a delivery run on Thursday. He said, do you want to help me out? And I said, I'd love to. And so we went down and we sat in the van for a couple hours as we were driving around the city and we talked and, 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 and we grieved and he allowed me to ask questions and he spoke truth into my life and and then we start talking about some of these trips that we used to, to experience together. And when we would bring students into the city and, and these projects that we did and homes that we worked on, we drove by some of them. We drove by the thrift store and, and, and saw where the students had painted. And we were in the, the women's shelter and we saw all these incredible things. And we laughed and we shared all these memories. And, and at one point in time, Joe was was reminiscing about these times together. And he said, you know what the best thing we ever did was? He said, the best moments of all those trips, it wasn't the block parties that we ran. It wasn't the work projects. It wasn't any building that, that, that got painted or any cabinets that got built. He said, the best thing that we ever accomplished in those trips was when these group of teenagers from the suburbs came and sat next to this inner city community that's predominantly African-American. We just worship together. We, we, we opened God's word together. We went before the throne together. He said, you know what? That was the best thing we ever did. You know, there's undoubtedly going to be moments when you and I disagree. And I'm not, I'm not making the case that we shouldn't. In fact, I think it's out of some of those disagreements. I think it's possible that that's some of the diversity in the church that leads to multifaceted responses, gospel responses. But I can say in the midst of that disagreement, I can commit to say, I I'm going to sit and listen. I can commit to the idea that, that I'm willing to consider the fact that perhaps I'm not right. 
and that you are. I can hear your ideas and your perspectives. I can commit to sitting down and praying with you, and I can commit that I will love you no matter where we land on a topic or an issue and how we understand it and how we come at it and that we'll search God's words and try to apply it in our lives. And that when all else fails, when perhaps in a moment when we cannot be on the same page, I can commit that we can come before the throne of our good God together, that he can meet us in that space and that we can worship him in a unified spirit because when we do that, when the world sees that in us, they'll see him. This is Paul's vision for the church. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this vision that Paul laid out. We thank you for this call to unity that you prayed that we would experience in the church. So Jesus, when, when I have allowed selfish ambition and vain conceit to poison unity, would you forgive me? when I have sought to fill some void, this, this glory void, through my own sense of self-righteousness or through my own sense of self-accomplishment, instead of finding it accomplished on the cross, Lord, would you forgive me? Lord, when my brothers and sisters in Christ, when we see things differently, when we struggle to understand each other's perspectives, would you give us humility? Would you give us ears to listen? And Jesus, if all else fails, if, we don't, if we're never able to get on the same page around a, a topic or an issue, would you usher us together before your throne where we would stand in your grace and the knowledge of what you have accomplished? Would you unify us as, as brothers and sisters in Christ because it's the best thing that we can do? And we ask all of this. In the name of Jesus, amen.